By far, the most chilling experiments we have uncovered took place at this Gothic estate called Raven's Crag, halfway up Mount Royal in Montreal. It houses the Allen Memorial Institute of Psychiatry of McGill University. It was here that the CIA funded a series of experiments, severe experiments. The work was done by the Institute's then director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. It is the closest experimentation to brainwashing yet disclosed. His work, unprecedented in psychiatry, consisted of three areas which he called sleep therapy, psychic driving, and the ultimate depatterning. Dr. Maurice Dangier, current head of the Allen Memorial Institute. In his uh, psychic driving, uh, so-called uh, type of, of therapy, he would give the patient intensive uh, electric treatment in order to make the patient uh, regress deeply, uh, become forgetful, and then he would uh, attempt to implant new ideas uh, in uh, the mind of the patient. Now, to a layman, it would appear that Dr. Cameron was trying to take the slate and wipe it clean, the slate being the mind. In other words, brainwashing. Exactly, that's a very good comparison. Brainwashing. Yes, to lie. Val Orlico of Winnipeg, Canada, the wife of a member of the Canadian Parliament, was a patient of Dr. Cameron's. She entered the Allen Memorial Institute because of severe depression. She describes for the first time publicly the LSD therapy and psychic driving treatment that she was given by Dr. Cameron. And then the drug began to take hold very rapidly because it was an IV injection. And... Um, Things became very furry and uh, very frightening and uh, had a lot of sensations that it's very difficult to recall. Nobody explained it to me. Nobody ever asked me if I was willing to do it or anything. He had this feeling that he would be able to get through the resistance of illness and, and, and to reach uh, deep changes very quickly. Did he? I don't think that so when you look at that in retrospect, the hopes that he had have been, has, have been in any way fulfilled. But Cameron would plunge on. The next step was what he called psychic driving. This involved almost endless tape-recorded messages and more drugs for the patient. Cameron wrote that this was the way to make direct control changes in personality. I thought this was the coldest and most impersonal treatment that anybody could give to anybody in the world. And I became more and more despondent and more and more angry. I just became so despondent that I thought I can't, I can't live like this any longer. And I thought I would just go out and throw myself underneath the cars on McGregor. I stood on the curb of that street and, and I stood there and I thought, okay, go, okay, go. And then I thought, what if you're not killed? What if you're just maimed? What if you don't die and you live and you can't even talk anymore? And I couldn't do it. The most severe technique Cameron used was depatterning. He described it as breaking up the existing patterns of behavior by means of intensive electroshock therapy with prolonged periods of sleep. He carried out these experiments in something he called the sleep rooms. People in there were like babies. They cried and they were very disoriented. And we were very afraid of the sleep room. We used to walk very carefully against the side of the corridor that was opposite the sleep room with our backs to the wall when we'd go by. Cameron used this combined sleep electroshock treatment on patients as long as 30 days. One patient he kept asleep for 65 days. Cameron retired, and his successor, Dr. Robert Cleghorn, ordered a follow-up study on the patients treated with Cameron's depatterning method. It showed that it was no more beneficial in its result than the use of more conservative methods. But the follow-up study showed that 60% of those who had been depatterned still had amnesia for periods of anywhere from six months to ten years. That's quite a memory loss, isn't it? That is a memory loss. Indeed it is. It's uh, more, I think, more than desirable. In retrospect, does Dr. Cameron's 
That experimentation and his treatment appear harsh? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, uh, uh, this forceful type of approach uh, that I was des describing to you uh, is definitely, it can be said that it's harsh. I wouldn't call it harsh. I would say it was harder on the staff than it was on the patients because these people had to be fed and they had to be cared for and they had to be uh, given sufficient fluid and food and toileted and so on and so forth. It was a, a very difficult uh, uh, thing for uh, the staff to, uh, to, uh, to follow these patients properly and see that they, they did well. <laughs> well, I'm glad he was concerned for the staff. But damn it all, I, I wouldn't... I, I, I could have maybe had a different kind of life. And that makes me angry and sad, and I don't know what, how to explain how I feel, really. I, I just... I just... <laughs> how did you feel when you learned that Dr. Cameron's experimentation was financed by the CIA. Well, I thought... Oh, I can't even use the word <laughs> that I thought. <laughs> because I thought, that bastard. And he was too smart. To, he knew. He knew who he was working for. And, um... Excuse me. But, um... I just, you know... I just can't... Sometimes I can't believe it. And yet I know it's true. If you had the opportunity to say something to the people at the Central Intelligence Agency who financed this study, what would you say? I, I realize the CIA is a very important organization and they have a very important job to do. But God, it surely doesn't have to be done on people who are totally incapable of knowing what's happening or having any defense against it. And I, I, I can't imagine the mentality of people who would do this. I just can't. As for Dr. Cameron, he died in 1966 while mountain climbing. A colleague wrote of Cameron, for him the ends justified the means. And when one is dealing with the waste of human potential, it is easy to adopt this stance. Dr. Cameron seemed ideally suited for what the CIA had in mind.